So, this is the weekly gathering. I thought that this view of the Berkshires would be appropriate. It looks like it's almost this time of the year. Oh, there we go. Or did you do that or did I do that? You did. Okay. The discussion tonight is the six parameters of the six parameters meditation. And this year's Ohegon begins tomorrow. And it ends on September 25th. The autumnal equinox falls in the middle of the seven days. That means Ohegon begins, as I said, tomorrow. And for those who don't know, Ohegon takes place in the autumn and in the spring. And it's one of the few Buddhist holidays that is tied to a celestial event. And I won't go into the symbolism of the equinox at this time, since I've done that so many times before. Maybe I'll do it next year. Um, and I'd like to link this week's discussion and the discussion presented by Kaiden to the six paramitas or six perfections, which are focused during Ohegon. And last week, Kaiden discussed Virya, the fourth paramita. And this week, I'll discuss the fifth paramita, Dhyana. And it ties in nicely with the presentation that Koshin did several weeks ago regarding posture and breath. So I think the meditation fits in nicely with this. Um, there we go. Okay. Uh, the six paramitas or perfections are guides for Buddhist practice and they're virtues to be cultivated to enable a Buddhist life and ultimately to bring one to enlightenment. They're intended to enable one to realize their Buddha nature. And this is acknowledging that one's true Buddha nature is obscured by our delusions, anger, and greed. By cultivating these perfections, we bring the true nature into expression. The six perfections are trainings. They're means and methods to an important end. And they are in and of themselves ideal. And by extension, if one embraces, embodies, and realizes these six dimensions of human character, then one would in fact be awakened or enlightened. Thus, it can be said that the six paramitas are the ideals to give purpose and direction to human life and ways of acting with character. More about that later. The term paramita is making reference to the other shore crossing over the river from samsara to awakening, which is nirvana. And the six perfections begin with Dana giving generosity, shila, morality, and ethics, kashante, patience, and tolerance. And you saw this last week. Uh, the first three of the six are considered appropriate for everyone at whatever stage of their practice they may be in. And that begins with the easiest generosity and moves toward the most difficult to attain, which is wisdom. And it is said that if you practice one, and you practice it with all your, your heart and spirit, your kokoro, then you practice all of them simultaneously. There's still a great deal of emphasis placed upon the sequential nature of the six perfections. <clears throat> the final three are said to be appropriate for those who have embarked upon the bodhisattva path seriously and have accomplished the first three of the paramitas. And the fourth one is Virya. Like I said, Kaiden did that last week. Um, and then the last one is Prajna or Wisdom. And that's where all the perfections culminate in that particular one. The fifth one is dhyana or meditation. Um, that one that was missing is a subject of tonight's discussion. You will at first glance think that dhyana is a bit different from the other five, insofar as the other five seem to be about qualities of character, whereas this one is about practice. Wright points out, that the contrast is deceptive because to be meditative, thoughtful, contemplative, imaginative, and calm is to possess a set of personal traits or characters that can be cultivated through meditative practices. More about that as we go. So when we start with meditation, in the modern vernacular in Euro-America, there are so many meanings to meditation. And it's a word that's used in Western philosophy that has its origins that are almost as ancient as Indian meditations. Think about Marcus Aurelius, Maimonides, St. Thomas Aquinas, or Rene Descartes. There are characteristics that are similar to Asian meditation, meditation philosophy. And in the Western context, meditation has been viewed as a spiritual practice intended to alter the practitioner's worldview 
and way of being in the world. And they require concentration and commitment, not so different than Asian meditation. However, when I give meditation instruction, which I have in the past, with Jewish or Roman Catholic communities on contemplative prayer and Jewish meditation, I resort to the sources such as Father St. Thomas Merton and Avram Joshua Heschel to inform those discourses. However, this evening we'll be limiting our discussion to Mahayana meditation, and more specifically Tiantai and Tendai-based meditations. From the Buddhist perspective, the intention of a meditation is to eliminate the three poisons, greed, aversion, and delusion, in order to reveal awakening. And this is certainly where the so-called secular mindfulness meditations have little in common with the traditional Buddhist meditations. Additionally, in so doing, we understand that the workings of our own minds seek the nature of reality. It's safe to say that all the Buddhist meditations share these two qualities. Tomes have been written about, uh, written about meditation in Sutra, Abhidharma, Shastra, and the commentaries, as well as the direct teachings such as those by Shigi and Shanran. A turf term that is often used to describe this is reflexive awareness. And I'd like to point out at this time that this perfection meditation is intimately tied to the first four because it has always been assumed that effective meditation is not possible without a basic level of morality, aptitude, teachers, and focused commitment. The fundamentals of meditation, and I'm going to go into this uh, quickly as a guide to meditation, uh, because we've been discussing that several weeks ago with, with uh, Koshin, and I'll spend more time on one element uh, in a few minutes. The first fundamental is posture. The key here is that the backbone is straight, and the reason that posture is important is that if the posture is not correct, the breathing will not be correct, and the mind will then wander. Koshin discussed it as such. The second fundamental is breath. Ichishima Sensei maintains that breathing is vital importance, if not the most important aspect of the meditation. Posture is really needed to breathe properly, and then breathing properly supports the mind. Without breathing properly, the mind will not attain either samatha or vipassana. Again, Koshin discussed these. The third fundamental is the mind or consciousness. Often, I use the word mind for this aspect of meditation. A better word is probably consciousness. That is what I would like to discuss in more detail this evening. Before that, I would like to make a brief distinction regarding the type of meditation that we're addressing, because it makes a difference when I speak about mind or consciousness. Dhyana Paramita refers to the virtue of meditation. And the picture, by the way, is a modern rendering of Chi Yi, the third ancestor of Tiantai Buddhism, who's responsible for major discourses on Shikan meditation, which are considered the source book of meditation by many Mahayana schools. Starting with Shikan, we have Shamatha, calming the mind, concentration, or tranquility. There are a number of different methods for calming the mind, observing the breath in and out, counting one to ten slowly to oneself, and with the count on the out breath, even counting to 100 or 500 as suggested in the Shoshikan. There are many other devices used to calm the mind when beginning. That can be abandoned when the practitioner becomes more adept. The idea is that the calmed mind has stillness and composure. Thoughts should not be intruding. In some lineages of Buddhism, this is the only type of meditation employed. The second type of Shikan, Shi would be Shamatha, Khan would be referring to Vipassana. Contemplation, discerning the real or insight into the nature of reality. Contemplation is intended to address consciousness capable of giving rise to enlightened wisdom. Often this can be accomplished by following a visualization of some sort, whether esoteric or exoteric, visualizing the qualities of a Buddha or a Bodhisattva, or contemplating a particular doctrinal statement from the Sutra or other sources, 
This is also encompassed in such practices as examining each of the five poisons and meditating in a way to provide five antidotes. And there are many other types of meditation that fall under this rubric. Again, in some lineages of Buddhism, this is the only type of meditation employed. As the Buddhist traditions evolved, relations between the two basic types of meditation were worked out in considerable detail. Shamatha meditation came to be regarded as a necessary condition for advancement in meditation because it gathers the mind out of added destruction, teaches it the powers of concentration and focus, and enables uh, that was, enables the mind to forego the pleasurable distractions in which the rest of us frequently are engaged. Similarly, shamatha meditation came to be regarded as a prerequisite for advancement since only in reflect, oh, I'm sorry. Similarly, Vipassana meditation came to be regarded as a prerequisite for advancement in calming meditation since only the, in reflection on the Dharma does the rationale for the pursuit of enlightenment become cogent and clear. In Shamatha meditation, the Buddhist worldview is articulated and cultivated to the point that it becomes part of the mental makeup of the practitioner. Each type of meditation supports the other and provides conditions making the other possible. Therefore, one frequently mentions one, one frequently mentioned image is that of the relation between these two practices is that of the two wings of a bird. Each wing represent one wing represents shamatha, the other wing represents vipassana, and without the two wings the bird couldn't fly. There are before I I, 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 want, I just want to mention here that many times people look at whether we're talking about shamatha and vipassana, whether we're talking about specifics of Qi Yi's instructions or someone else, etc. And we treat these as though each one is sacrosanct and as though one is the best. There is no best. They're all good. Which one works for you? And this can be based upon how old you are, uh, what situation you are in your life right now compared to some other time. There's a whole series of things that can determine those things. And I, and I think we sometimes get hung up on it has to be done this way. And all of the uh, Makashikan and Shoshikan and all those others are ways to inform people here is a way to do it not this is the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think we also get hung up in, oh, I've got to try this one. I did that one before. Oh, been there, done that. Now I'm going to try this other one. No. You find, and that's part of the, that's part, really part of the, uh, I think, uh, attraction of Tendai Buddhism. It recognizes that one method isn't right for everybody. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find that which works for you. That was a basic dictum of Shakyamuni Buddha. However, going on, there are two other aspects of meditation um, that I want to go into. The first is the practice, something one does with purpose and discipline. And that's what we've been discussing thus far. The second is several qualities of mental character that are mentioned as accessible practice of meditation. It's tempting for me to use the traditional Tian Tai texts of Ji Yi, such as the Makashikan or Shoshikan, as authoritative as these might be. Rather, I'm going to use contemporary materials. Um, these references are employing the message of the tradition explained in terms more easily understood today. One of the, I think one of the things that we get hung up with quite often in looking at some of the ancient materials, which I think looking at source material is absolutely necessary. Don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not saying otherwise. But I think that it really requires a lot of explanation as to what was really meant 1,200 years ago or 1,500 years ago or wherever it was, whenever it was. So I'm going to use terminology that is more recognizable today as opposed to something that we would be reading about from from Qi Yi, which would be about 1,500 years ago. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
In the, for this purpose, I'm relying on Dale Wright's The Six Perfections, in his book on The Six Perfections, aligning it with Essentials of Buddhist Meditation, The Essentials for Practicing Calming and Insight, and Dhyana Meditation by Bhikshu Dharmamitra for consistency. And I'm paraphrasing or quoting from, from Wright in many places without further attribution, just to know that I'm using a lot of his stuff. Okay. Because I'm not going to go and reinvent it. I paraphrase because I stitch stuff together. Um, we might think of human consciousness. Let's see, is that right? Yeah. We might think of human consciousness as having three levels of awareness. Let us think of the mind in terms of human consciousness. When we use the term mind, we think of it in a delineated fashion, conceiving the mind as the neuroelectrical chemical reactions that occur inside the brain. We're, we're stuck in a Western paradigm of, my mind is up here. Stop it. <clears throat> conceiving the mind in that way is a kind of delusion that was introduced with our friend Descartes, by the way. <laughs> um, as biology and physics study the nature of consciousness, it's revealed that the nature, that the neuromatrix that occurs in our skulls is only part of the story. So let's get away from thinking about the mind as occupying this stuff up here and thinking about consciousness as being present throughout our body and around us and part of the universe as opposed to me, 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 me my consciousness, it's not my consciousness, our consciousness, the universal consciousness, we just have to be tapping into a piece of this. I will use Wright's convention in referring to this as human consciousness. Virtually all forms of Buddhism maintain that knowing one's own mind or consciousness through meditative introspection was considered the single most productive knowledge that anyone could hold. The first, or basic level of consciousness, is immediate experience. Now think about this. We talked about the practice of Shikang, calming the mind, discerning the real. I didn't go into a lot of detail, which we've done many, many times before. Now we're looking at something a little bit different. Let's look at the human, at the human consciousness. And, and this, by the way, is something that Maka Shikan does. The Maka Shikan really does look at it this way. I'm just using it in terms that are more uh, contemporary, as opposed to the terms of Chigi or um, the others we use. So the first is the basic level of consciousness, which is immediate experience, a direct awareness using the senses. And this includes the feelings of various kinds that pass through us without our reflecting on them, such as gratitude and anger. So. When we start the meditation, I say, um, what, what, what do I say? Does anybody know what I say? Does that <laughs> allow your mind to dissolve within the, the sound, sound of the, the bell. bell? Well, I say that, but even before that, <laughs> if the thought comes into your, your mind, mind observe oh, it, it yeah. right? Drop it. Let it go. Now, allow your mind to dissolve within the sound of the bell. Um, this form of immediate experience is an unselfconscious experience in which we seek to examine what it means to be meditator. We're thinking. Tell me that you've never thought about as you're meditating. Am I meditating? <laughs> Nobody's ever done that, right? We never do that. You're sitting there thinking, yeah, but am I meditating? I might do it tonight now that you bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's seeding. I, I've got some other things up in your mind. Okay. Um, so, what, what, what it means to be meditative in relation to our most basic consciousness in the world. This is what we refer to as shamatha. Shamatha, calming the mind. You let things... By the way, let's just get it out in the open now. You can never em empty your mind. Forget about it. Forget about it. You're not going to empty your mind. There are times that you'll reach what I'll refer to as Kensho state, in which it happens, but you can't make it happen. And the more you try, 
the worst it gets. It's like Craig was referring to, now that I've placed that idea in his mind, it's done for the night, right? This requires both a suspension of the activities of thinking and the exercise of mental convergence and fixity. The point of this contemplative exercise is to slow down and temporarily stop the frantic racing of the mind from one experience to another. It's a practice of silence, a stilling of the mental noise that prevents calm states, focus, and study awareness. So the idea of, of shamatha in just a few words is not just to let it go, but the, one of the terms for shamatha is concentration. You're focusing. That's why when you're beginning, counting the breath is useful. Another practice could be taking a particular Bija character such as Ah and just saying that over and over again. Ah, ah. It, allow, it, it has the effect of allowing you to ignore the other stuff that's going on. That's really what it comes down to. Mm. It, you want to ignore the other stuff. And as mentioned earlier, Shikan meditation is composed of Shamatha and Vipassana, calming the mind and discerning the real, and they are like the two wings of the bird. Both are required to meditate effectively. And that's the other thing. Uh, and here we see how it works with the human consciousness level. Now again, there are schools of Buddhism that focus on just Shamatha. There are other schools of Buddhism that look at koan. There are other schools of Buddhism that have specific practices. Um, so it's not that all of Buddhism is going to go one way or the other. The way I'm presenting it this evening is the Tiantai, Tendai way of, of doing this. The, <coughs> excuse me. The next level of human consciousness is reflexive or reflective thinking. This is where we begin to engage Vipassana. Reflective thinking goes beyond direct awareness. When engaged at the reflective level of consciousness, we raise questions about what we have experienced. We deliberate, make judgment. Is this reality what it appears to be? By employing the mental tools of critical thinking, the reflective area level of awareness enables broader and more nuanced understanding. This is expansion of consciousness makes deliberate choice among alternatives possible, and its cultivation enhances our capacity to make sound decisions. Many forms of meditation work within the parameters of this level of consciousness, and part of our task will be to explore what it is to engage them. In thought, we step back out of immediate awareness in order to inquire and reflect on some dimension of it. The difference between the first and second levels of consciousness is that there are no thought processes engaged at the first level of immediate experience. Mm -hmm. Reflective experience focuses not on the thing before us, as it does in the first example of, of consciousness, but on the complex relation between my mind and the thing. At this level, we are, we are aware of the relationships that our mind and our emotions have to these things. And this step back overcomes the naivete of immediate awareness to adding the power to question what otherwise seems self-evident. This can also be referred to as philosophical meditation. It's not easy, it's hard to learn, and it requires concentration and discipline. And by the way, uh, as I was reading that, I was just imagining some things in Makashi Khan that talk about this, <laughs> this very thing in, in very different, and the Fadi in very different, in very different ways. Um, so it's, it, that's part of what advised this. We're just using different language. So this is not a, a, a new way of looking at it. This is just interpret, uh, using different words for the same process. That's all it is. The third level of human consciousness, reflexivity, or self-awareness that has evolved through the resources 
provided by the first two. You had shamatha, second level of consciousness, which begins vipassana. Now, after you've been doing it for a while, shazam, you're ready to get in there a little bit deeper. And self-awareness, we continue in vipassana and in the third form of human consciousness. This is also referred to as reflexive consciousness. The mind bends back in awareness of itself. Stop and think about that for a moment. The mind that bends back in reflection of itself. I can't emphasize this too much. The subtle awareness is to plumb the depths of that awareness. Beyond the objects of our awareness of the first level and our thinking about them in the second, in self-awareness of one of the two whose experience this is, whereas the things of experience and our thoughts about them can become objects of reflection. We can get in front of our mind's eye in order to contemplate them. The one who does this cannot be similarly objectified. The idea is to avoid objectification. It's reflective, it's looking at the process, and it's, but at the same time, it's done in such a way that you're not analyzing it. It's not an analytic process. It's an observational process. Now, I cannot see myself in this as subject when you're doing this. My subjectivity as such, in any direct way, because I'm always the one doing the seeing. Mm. This is incredibly subjective. As soon as we look at something, we change it. We know that from physics. Well, that's one of the basics of physics today. You can't, you can't run an experiment without your projecting onto it, which changes the outcome of the experiment. And so it is in this third level of consciousness. The fact that you are sitting and doing it changes what it is. It's, it goes without saying that that's part of being deluded all the time. We just are, we, we're not aware of it. We think that what, we, what we're experiencing is the reality. When what we're experiencing is what we're projecting to experience. So we have to tear ourselves away from that and al allow ourselves to look at it in a way knowing that we're changing its outcome, but knowing that we're getting closer and closer and closer. Given deep enough meditation, one's existence reveals itself as impermanent. Here's the bottom line. As impermanent and independent with a wide variety of other beings. It's never about me. That's what really is crazy about this. When you're doing it effectively, it stops being about me. It's being self-aware of impermanence and independence simultaneously with other beings. All set within frameworks that are metaphysical, physical, and social. We will want to explore the contemplative possibilities of this third dimension of human consciousness as carefully as possible. <coughs> Every level of consciousness brings with it greater and greater spheres of freedom. If you do not realize that what seems obvious to you seems that way because of the structure built into your time and place and in the particularities of your life, you'll have very little room to imagine other ways to look at things 
that stretch the borders of our context and imagination. In other words, part of that process is to recognize that I am who I think I am because of the time and place, the connections that I have, that make me think that I'm autonomous. When in fact, impermanence is part of the feature. At the same time, there's still independence. We still make decisions. It's not that we're not making decisions. It's that the decisions that we make are being guided by our time and place. And this meditation in the third level of consciousness allows us to see, to open that up and see that. And especially this last idea, if, and I'm just going to read that whole paragraph again, if you do not realize that what seems obvious to you seems that way because of the structures built into your time and place in and the particularities of your life, you will have very little room to imagine other ways to look at things that stretch the borders of your context and imagination. This brings us to the final aspect of the meditation. This is alluded to in many of the traditional writings, but never really examined quite the way that Wright portrays it. And so I, I found it interesting that we almost never talk, well, I shouldn't say that because I talk about it all the time, but <laughs> we, we seldom really read about the relationship of imagination and meditation. True samadhi, deep meditation, requires imagination. Somehow we think that it's, I don't know, sort of like there are stages that we, well, I guess the Abhidharma presents it as there are stages that we go through. We've got to go through one before we can get to two and two before we can get to three. And it gives us the idea that it's all sort of laid out of, laid out for us. We just have to, you know, follow this path. It requires something much more and that is imagination. But that also is a little bit of the difference between uh, Nikaya Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. So, we're going to call this meditative imagination. And this is the last item that I'm going to talk about, and it also acts as a conclusion. Imagination has played an important role in Buddhist meditation from the earliest stages of the tradition. In meditation, practitioners sought to imagine some state of affairs quite other than the one they, that are, is currently in effect. Right? We imagine something else. They imagine their bodies as corpses, the nine stages of decrepitude, or their anger, greed, or envy, cooled by the reasons of calm, selfless serenity. I'm going to imagine that I'm extending unconditional loving kindness to my mother through her suffering. That's imagination. They imagine the character and content of the Buddha's enlightenment and try to form images of what their own lives would look like if they pursued those ideals. We do meditation on imagining. We're going to do a meditation tonight, which is totally imagination. But imagine, imagine, imagine. Um, sounds like major, major from Catch-22. So imagine if you will, that what we're talking about is without perceiving the world around us, projecting upon it what we want it to be, we can't change it. We would be stuck in the same place all the time. It's only through our imagination that we can begin to break away from that. So the power of imagination is a basic condition for the possibility of human freedom, freeing us from the domination of the present world 
the imagination opens up the space of alternatives to the present. In imaginative acts, we submit the given to questioning by envisioning what might come to be in its place. A simple lack of imagination is one form of human diminishment. Meditation, meditative cultivation of the imagination is the best way out of these forms of mental closure or habitual ways of thinking. The meditative development of imagination is distinct from fantasy. When it functions creatively, it stays in tune with our actual possibilities, not something that is out of our grasp. It shows us what is at stake in cultivating one or more paths that might be right now be open to us. People of integrity are not in hiding. And this is from Wright. They are not afraid to appear to be awkward and uncertain beings that all of us are in fact. This eclipse of fear derives from seeing their true place in the cosmos and it yields a profound degree of equanimity and ease, residing immediately in themselves and opening out to the world. They have a presence that others in their self-consciousness lack. At this level, however, the meditative results that we are describing pertain to what Buddhists prefer to call wisdom. This is an appropriate place to stop. And each of these three levels of consciousness and imagination are discussed in an expanded fashion in Dale Wright's book, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. So I encourage you to buy that if you do not already have it. And to read it. Don't just buy it, but read it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. there, there's a wonderful term in Japanese for a pile of books that you have not read. What is it? Do you, do, I, I can't remember. Do you remember, Tomomi, what that word is? I'm just trying to remember what I just... <laughs> there's, there's a Japanese term for a pile of books that, that sit around that you have not read yet. You, you, no, you bought it, so you intended to read it, but it sits there. The interesting thing about that is it's not telling us, um, it's, it's not sort of, of saying shame on you, you bought that and you didn't read it. It's telling us that, that term, it's telling us of the possibilities, that there's something that's always there that I can do. There's another book that I, I can now attempt to read. Um, I'm unfortunately one of those people who reads about a half a dozen books at one time yeah, and I've got them all over the place um, and I, I find it really interesting that somehow I can keep track of it without you know going back to the previous chapter or whatever but that's that's a marvelous thing anyway and so the the um, Wright's book is the one that I've got in bold on, the, on there, so you can see what it is if you're interested, and if you don't already have it. We can ask um, Ichishima Sensei what that word is. Yeah, I'll have to, maybe yeah. he knows. I, 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 I think it's <laughs> relatively recent. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's okay. So, so I, I think this really basically explains the situation. So let's ask some questions and comments, but first ask Ichishima Sensei if you have anything that you would like to to share with us. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, today is uh, Ohigan, the first day in Japan. Uh, Higan, as you know, you mentioned as you mentioned uh, that is uh, from Param Ita, uh, Paranta. Uh, Param is the, uh, the highest goal of uh, uh, meditation. And uh, so let's go to the higher goal of meditation. Anyway, according to Japanese tradition, uh, the ancestors supposed to be in the West with Amitabha. So the equinox day, really uh, sun rises exactly from the east side and the uh, set in the uh, west side very straight so um, people visit their tomb uh to pay uh, pray for their 
ancestors peace uh, in Ohingan Day. So it is very interesting. And also, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, the six, seven, oh, excuse me, eighth centuries great pandit Skara, uh, Kamarashira, he said, you know, Upaya with Prajna, Prajna with Upaya. His decision is, what shall I say? Uh, the first five perfections, starting from dana to meditation, dhyana, he calls it upaya, skillful means. And skillful means is very important to uh, save all the sentient beings. That is upaya equal, uh, what shall I say, karuna, uh, compassion. So this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, according to Ratnakara Shanti, who made a commentary to the Sutra Samcha by Nagarjuna, he says the uh, the third turning field of Dharma is the Kamarashira's definition of Rupaya with Prajna and provide moksha, liberation. So this is my just uh, thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. You're welcome. Well, why don't we turn off the um, recording? <laughs>